We want to come back and look some more in conclusion to the subject of the pagan festival of Easter tonight. We want to look some more, not at its origins, but as we did with Christmas, at the commercialization of Easter, how <clears throat> some things like the chocolate bunnies and things like this became attached so firmly to this holiday and entrenched in the minds of people whenever this time of the year comes around. The commercialization, <clears throat> just like with Christmas, is something that's fairly recent. The commercialization, but the origins of the commercialization go back a long, long time ago, a lot earlier than Christmas. I believe that we've already pointed out with regard to a difference between <clears throat> Easter and Christmas that Easter has a much earlier origin than Christmas does. And so the same is true with the origins for the commercialization. Now, they didn't have big factories where you could manufacture milk chocolate bunnies and things like this hundreds of years ago. <laughs> Those things are recent, obviously. But what about just the bunny itself? Is that recent? No, that goes back a long, long time ago. Just in this century have we seen this widespread commercialization in the United States and Europe and throughout the world, which is just another sign of the great delusion of Satan over the whole world. I think that John talks about over in 1 John 5 that the whole world lies in the hands of the wicked one. So let's look at the egg. Have you ever asked yourself the question, like with St. Nick and reindeer and chimneys and mistletoe, where's the connection between all of those things and Jesus? Where's the connection between an egg, a white egg, or if they're good and fresh, a good brown one like we get ours from next door, an egg and Jesus? What's the connection between an egg and Jesus? It's the same with St. Nicholas and mistletoe, and I don't even remember all the names of the reindeer. I'd be ashamed if I did remember all their names, but all the little reindeer, you're supposed to have all their names memorized. Prancer, there's one of them. I just, that came to my mind because I can see him still pawing the snow up on top of the house. Maybe that's where he got his name Prancer from. I don't remember the rest of them. Don't anyone tell me or we'll ask you, why do you still remember those things? <laughs> But where's the connection? There's no connection except in paganism. There is a connection in paganism, Amen. which means there's no way that you can be celebrating either the birth of Christ or the resurrection of Christ. Neither one can you be celebrating under the guise of the Mass for Christ or Easter because we do see connections in paganism to holidays in the past that go by similar names. If not similar names, they're the identical same festivities and superstitions with the festival. And we just don't see those connections whenever you bring it over into the New Testament, to Jesus, and to so forth. You know, you really wouldn't have to do a study like this. Just read the Bible. Amen. Just read the New Testament. Amen. It's just that most people don't. Right. I've said before, there are a lot of things that we believe as overcomers that shouldn't be peculiar to overcomers. They're just right in the New Testament. Amen. They're just right in the Bible. Right. That if you press your Christianity far enough, I'm talking about everything that we do. Amen. If you press your Christianity far enough, you're going to come up with that sooner or later. Amen. Medical science, that shouldn't have to be a little neat one of the six doctrines of the overcomers. If you live your Christianity like the Bible teaches it, you're going to end up with divine healing immediately. Amen. You'll just end Amen. up with divine healing. Amen. That's one of the things that helped uh, hurdle me over all these things in a hurry is to find out this isn't just some peculiar doctrine of a man or of a church or of some 20th century movement today. It's not just some peculiar doctrine. It's right in the Word of God. Amen. Forsaking all and following Jesus, people say that's you know a little extreme and and your position concerning your family and your loved ones, that's a little extreme. Well, that's right in the Bible. Amen. He said the, the chief foes you would have would be those of your own household. That's what he said. People, if they really are, are Christians and really study their Bible, would have to ask themselves, why don't my relatives hate me? Amen. Because Jesus said that they would. Amen. Isn't that right? Amen. He said that they would. He said they'd be your chief foes. Maybe not forever. But they would at some time be your chief enemy. Mm -hmm. And if they're not, either he was misguided 
or like Nostradamus, he gave a false prophecy there, or you're not living your Christianity like you should be. And of course, you know what you'd come up with. I'm not living my Christianity like I should be. Or you'd end up with things like this. Easter, Christmas, we don't have to find a verse that tells us not to celebrate them. There aren't verses that tell us to celebrate them. That's right. enough yeah. for me. Amen. I praise the Lord, like I've said before, for Jeremiah 10. But I don't have to have Jeremiah 10. Mm -hmm. I don't have to have a verse that talks about people who worship evergreen trees not to worship them myself. Mm -hmm. You would get that from the rest of the Bible that speaks against idolatry. Right. And especially in the Old Testament that speaks against nature worship. You would just come up with that sooner or later. Non-resistance, not serving in the armed forces. Well, we talked about that yesterday in Power Ethics. Just read about gentleness and love and meekness in Jesus' life and the apostles' teaching. How could you go to war and shoot someone and be a gentle, peace-loving, merciful, thoughtful, kind, tender, loving, forgiving person? Well, you couldn't. Voting? Why well, have to have a doctrine over that when you study the sovereignty of God? He doesn't need you pulling a one-armed bandit to get someone elected. He doesn't need that. He puts up one and brings down another. Amen. Well, the same thing is true with the holidays. We shouldn't have to do a study. And we wouldn't if the whole world weren't deceived and if the whole world were following in the teachings of the Word of God. We pressed our Christianity on the basis of the New Testament. We'd end up with an anti-stance concerning the holidays. Well, let's get back to the egg was a pagan practice that came right out of Babylon. We don't hesitate tracing the origins of all of these things ultimately back to Babylon. And it is practiced to this day all over the world, even in nations which don't celebrate a so-called Easter festival. That's true. All over the world today. There are still these little games that are played with eggs. But in many countries who do celebrate some type of spring festival, then during the springtime, the eggs are, by different dyes and so forth, colored in order to represent the manifold birth of life in the springtime. That's when the birds lay their eggs and the babies hatch and other little animals and creatures are born and the flowers come forth and the trees begin to bud. And what do you have? Rather than just the gray, the brown, the white, the bleakness of wintertime, you have a multitude of colors spring forth in the springtime. And so that is the origin of the coloring of the eggs. They didn't have to wait until they went to the supermarket and picked up one of these little Easter egg packages of dye, there were ancient forms of dye that have been known for centuries and centuries where people in the past, just like they do today, colored their eggs. Do you remember your mother getting you one of those little dye packages and, and you'd spend all afternoon at the kitchen table with eggs on the stove just to boiling away and you had so much fun you felt like Dracula or something mixing up a little potion there on the table and getting it the right color and then dipping your little eggs there. You remember having fun doing that? Did you know that you were participating in ancient Babylonian nature worship? Exactly. That's right. None of us did. The packages didn't come, you know, with a little warning from Surgeon General. <laughs> Be informed that the consumer of this package is a participant, albeit unknowingly, in Babylonian nature worship. They should have, Amen. <laughs> because that's what it is. It's Babylonian nature worship, and yet we spent many spring days around the kitchen table. It was a lot of fun to mix up the little potions and make yourself feel like a mad scientist while you colored the eggs. And you didn't know what you were doing. You didn't know that is, and you see we laugh about it, but we're talking about direct worship of demons and Satan is what that is. He doesn't have to come and appear to you with horns and a pitchfork and you bow down before him for you to be involved in Satanism and in Satan worship. What we're wanting you to see in all of this is when you go to the store during certain times of the year and you see whole racks covered with little chocolate bunnies and all types of little candies and things, don't just look over there and think, what a neat thing. That is occultism. 
And you have to have your mind illuminated to this and your eyes open yeah. so that there is the reaction in your mind and your spirit like there should be That's right. whenever you see all of that. That is, that is an affront to God. It's, it's worship of Satan and demons. And if one thing it is, it's anti-Christian is what it is. Yet I think probably Christians are the ones who are caught up in it the most. That's right. Because they think yeah. somehow they've got it related to the Bible and to their Savior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's an old Babylonian legend uh -oh. that tells of the fall of an egg from heaven mm -hmm. that landed in the Euphrates and cracked open and hatched the goddess Ishtar. Mm -hmm. That's an old Babylonian legend. Mm -hmm. You know, of all things, why did Ishtar come from an egg? And as we are going to see as we go throughout the study tonight, there is a vital connection between Ishtar as well as her husband, Tammuz, and the pagan festival that's been Christianized as Easter. So we have to ask the question, how then did this become attached to Easter? That is, to the Easter as we know it. Well, in the first place, we're already showing you. We've shown you in the past that, there's, that there is a connection between Ishtar and Tammuz in this pagan festival. Remember the origins of Easter? Uh, Tammuz was the, god, was the god of agriculture, and it was his death, his mother or his wife's weeping over him, which brought about his resurrection, which symbolized the rebirth of nature in the springtime after the coldness and the death of winter. We've already talked about Ishtar and Tammuz last week, I believe. So one connection, since we know that we got our Easter from a Babylonian celebration, one connection is this legend concerning Ishtar falling in an egg out of heaven in the Euphrates, which, remember, runs right through Babylon. It all ties together. Uh, cranks open and out pops Ishtar. So there's one connection. But the main connection between the egg and Easter, as we know it today, concerns this 40-day silly farce of a fast known as Lent that we talked about before. Two foods that were forbidden during Lent time were meat and eggs. We see the connection with meat. That's just a prevalent doctrine of demons. That's why it's set forth over in 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 to 4. But what about this, this egg business? Well, during Lent, it was forbidden of the people to partake of the egg because it was sacred to the Babylonians. Remember, this whole 40-day fast period came right out of Babylonian worship of Tammuz because, remember, they uh, connected with the Feast of Tammuz and his resurrection. There was a 40-hour fast that preceded that that was supposed to symbolize the 40 years of his life before he was finally killed by a stampeding wild boar. And then back as early as the canons of Nicaea in A.D. 325, we already find a reference there to a 40-hour fast that precedes this Christian festival known as Easter. It wasn't known as Easter then, by the way. It didn't have a particular name, but this festival that was copied from the Babylonians. There was a 40-hour fast. How came the 40 days? Well, remember, there's got to be some type of parallel to the Bible. You've got to spiritualize things. And so they went to the Bible and found at least three occasions where a man of God went on a 40-day fast. And so they extended the 40 hours to a 40-day period, which the Pope called a sacred fast, and we said is a silly farce because no one fasts for 40 days. And yet what is it known as Lent, the 40-day period of fasting? But nobody fasts. And back in the early centuries, they enforced it rather strictly in comparison to today, where you are allowed to have a meal at night. You can have one meal a day. That's not even done today. And many of the people even have given up meat now. That is, given up the abstinence from it. They've gone back to it now. There's no fast at all involved. But it's supposed to be a time of weeping and fasting and crying and penitence and so forth. Well, during Lent, it, this egg was forbidden because it was sacred to the Babylonians. And so on, after you've gone through this 40-day trial of no bacon and eggs in the morning, after this long 40-day trial of no eggs, then on Easter morning, everyone in the community would bring to their local bishop or priest or whatever a whole basket full of eggs. They couldn't eat of them for the last 40 days. 
and your local bishop or whatever priest would bless the eggs would sanctify them and afterwards you could eat of them <laughs> and this is what brought about because because of this long <laughs> well, some of you are getting the connections there because of this long uh, period of prohibition against eggs then no one wanted to just get right into eating the eggs right away they wanted to play games with the <laughs> eggs because they had been without them for so long it's like a craving that you get for eggs when you go without them for 40 days I haven't been without eggs for 40 days living next to a poultry farm so I don't know what it would be like if you got withdrawal symptoms or what you're supposed to have <laughs> <laughs> But I guess that the early Catholics did because whenever they did bring them to, and maybe you could even get in the presence of the Pope himself. Uh, the Pope was the one who initiated the whole process when a Pope came about in Catholic Christendom by declaring the egg to be sacred on that day and blessed, and then your local priest or bishop or whatever would then just further the process by laying his hands on the little baskets of eggs that everybody would bring and bless them. But the people wanted to have games with them, and so they were already colored because you're following the Babylonian practice of representing the manifold colors of life that are brought forth, and so what do you do? Well, you have your famous Easter egg hunt. You spread your little eggs out throughout all of the crooks and crannies in the old cathedral, or sooner than do that, people would rather go outside and hide them in the tall grass and the different trees and different places that you could find to hide your eggs and thus we have the origin of the famous Easter egg hunts. Now they didn't come to full play until like I say until after that but you got the origins of all of it right here. We're after abstaining for so long from the eggs and people would you know have fun with the eggs and they would toss them around and hide them and play with them and then you're supposed to eat them. And they weren't hard-boiled back then either. I mean, that was a modern invention, too, to hard-boil your eggs and different things like that. But anyway, they're supposed to hide them and hope that they don't rot for the 40 days. And when you bring them to church and then hide them and hope you don't lose them and find them next week and dig them up and eat them then or whatever. They said that the representation, the Catholic Church said that the representation was that Christ was brought forth from the tomb just like a chick comes out of the egg. Wow. What? <laughs> what do you remember those little Easter egg hunts you used to have before church on Easter morning? No. Or after church on Easter morning? It depends on the family when you would have your little hunt. Sometimes it was just too much dew on the ground to get out there before church. But afterwards, you could hardly wait to get home. Easter was a time for the little girls to have on new white dresses with lots of frill on them and those, remember those new little white or black shiny shoes that you would get to wear on an Easter morning and I don't know what the little boys wore, I don't remember a particular outfit, but I know it was time for bow ties though. Easter morning was time for a bow tie. And what's worse than that, one of those little fake clip-on bow ties, you know. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I don't know if anybody wears clip-on ties out there, but... You better be glad I'm past my childhood days of pulling on people's ties. <laughs> if you wore clip-ons, it's quite embarrassing whenever an unbehaved child would come up and pull on your tie and would pull it right off because it was a clip-on. I don't own a clip-on. I hope you don't own a clip-on tie. <laughs> what more of a fake could you ask for than a clip-on tie? <laughs> I don't own one. I used to own them whenever I was a boy because I guess I was two fumble fingers to know how to tie a tie. But I know those little bow ties. I mean, bow ties, they're not out of style today. They're, they're not my style, but they're not out of style today. But very few people wear a real bow tie that you have to tie yourself. One of these little clip-on deals. Well, look around. Not everybody has a tie in, on in here tonight, but you can kind of get behind them and look under the collar and see if it's really there or not. Well, we, <laughs> we've been talking in prosperity about all these fake things. That's another example. <laughs> I've got a button down on so I couldn't lift mine up. That's probably why I wore it tonight. No, I've got a real time on. 
<laughs> oh, I know a lot of people. Not, I'm not thinking of anyone in here in particular, but I know people who wear those clip-on ties. I just would feel like a frog wearing something like that. You feel deceptive wearing it. People think you've got a tie on. <laughs> I think some people are so backwards they don't even know how to tie their own ties. So it's easier either to have your wife tied or to <laughs> just wear a little clip-on. Well, that's what Easter morning was for. Little boys wore little clip-on bow ties and little girls wore little white frilly dresses with little shiny black or white shoes and after church you went home and had a big Easter egg hunt. There was a prayer, a prayer formula that was given during the 17th century by Pope Paul V which again declared the connection between Jesus and the egg. And this is a direct quote from the writings of Catholicism. A prayer formula that the Pope was supposed to give on Easter morning and that was to be further carried out by your local bishop or priest so that the eggs could be consumed. Where he said, Bless, O Lord, we beseech thee, this thy creature of eggs. <laughs> well, you know, the creature, that's Jesus, thy creature of eggs that it may become wholesome sustenance. Remember, you eat him in the communion service. You eat Jesus in the communion service. Bless, O Lord, we beseech thee, this thy creature of eggs, that it may become wholesome sustenance unto thy servants. Mm. Came right from Pope Paul V in the 17th century. It was a little Easter morning egg prayer formula that declare the connection, remember Christ came from the earth like a chick comes from the egg, between Jesus and the egg. But the real connection is back into Babylonian nature worship. The hatching of the chick out of the egg was in a way supposed to symbolize the resurrection of Tammuz from the dead. It's kind of like the breaking forth out of the ground, the resurrection, as you crack the egg and the chick sticks its beak through and then the head through, then the whole chick wobbles out into a new existence, a new form of life. And so there's the connection. It was based right on the death and the, res the, the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the God's hands. And so you see right away, they say, well, Jesus was in the tomb himself. And so you get the angel in there and the stone over the tomb in there and you fit all this together and you have him cracking and breaking out of there just like a little chick comes out of the egg. So the Pope said, Bless, O Lord, we beseech thee, this thy creature of eggs, that it may become wholesome sustenance unto thy servants. You're supposed to recognize Jesus as hatching out of an egg. And in the communion service, and you always have a mass every time you go to church, then he was to be a wholesome sustenance as you partook of him. What about the hair? Right alongside the egg, we have to mention the hair because they go together. Well, the hair in ancient Babylon served as a symbol of fecundity or fertility because of its fast reproduction cycle. Reproduction, that is the bringing forth of new life. Well, again, you see the associations with nature worship. It's the springtime, the bringing forth of new life, and there's hardly anything that reproduces like and as quick as an old hare, an old rabbit does. But one thing that's interesting that people fail to recognize, evidently in the past, and maybe they didn't even know it, I don't know, is that little rabbits are live-born. They don't come from eggs. Little rabbits don't hatch out of eggs. And, and most people kind of just think that, you know. You can even probably ask a, a, a botanist or a biologist on Easter morning, where does a rabbit come from? He'd say an egg. He gets confused on that morning. <laughs> and even if he weren't a professional in that field, he'd probably say the same thing. He'd probably say that when it wasn't Easter morning. If you just somehow mention the word Easter, because right away what comes to your mind, a rabbit and an egg come to your mind. And so if you don't know any better, you think rabbits, like birds, come out of eggs. They don't come out of eggs. Rabbits and little hare are live-born animals. They don't like a little possum. They don't come out of an egg. 
So there really shouldn't be the connection. But there is because of the fast reproduction cycle. So it wasn't until this century that the chocolates and all of the other candies arose. And they are really what have taken, what have taken over the commercialization of Easter today. Not many people really get a live hare or a live rabbit on Easter morning like used to be passed around. It was time not only to share eggs, but to share your newborn rabbits or your newborn hare during ancient times. No, but you probably didn't get a hare in your Easter basket, a literal one, unless it was one of your mother's gray ones on Easter morning or on Easter <laughs> afternoon. But you would get a lot of little milk chocolate ones there, though. <laughs> the stores will be flooded out. We're giving you plenty of warning in advance. Some of the holidays are upon us. Some of them are a long time from now. But you watch when that time comes around. The shelves will just be filled with milk, with these dumb milk chocolate rabbits there. And people will just gobble the things down, not knowing they're worshiping Tammuz, Babylonian god. And the same is true with all of the jelly beans and the little creamy candies that come out that time. You know, whenever you produce rabbits, let's go all out. They're going to produce all types of candy then. And all these different types of candy got associated somehow in the past with this festival, with this holiday, and people just gobble the things up whenever that day comes around. I remember we would go home after church on Sunday Easter morning. There'd be a basket. You'd have the funny little fake grass in there, like pink-colored grass in the bottom of your thing, like grass is pink, but it would cover the bottom, just be overflowing with these little marshmallow-type candies and jelly beans and sometimes some big rabbits. Those rabbits could be expensive. You know, more expensive than, I guess, a real rabbit would. Really expensive rabbits. I never got a live rabbit. But oh, did we have fun out in the backyard wading through the high grass. You want to make sure not to mow it for two weeks ahead of time so it's high and no one can find the eggs. And you'd play around for two hours looking for Tammuz out there in your backyard. <laughs> not knowing that's what you're doing. Not knowing, I just came home from Protestant Catholic Christianity. Now I'm worshiping nature and Tammuz and Ishtar, the Babylonian form of religion out here. We're not stretching this to make something out of it that it's not. We have to ask ourselves, where is the origin for all these things? It's not in the Bible. It didn't start yesterday or the week before or two months ago or five years ago. Where is the origin of these things? Everything had to have a beginning at some time. That's right. And they didn't have a beginning in the Word of God. They had a beginning back in Babylon. That's right. That's right. And you can't be honest with yourself and just pass over that and say, well, I don't know about all that. Do some study yourself then. Just read the Bible. You'd be amazed at what it doesn't say about the holidays. It's too concerned about overcoming and putting to death the life of self so that you don't have time to encourage yourself to pass out presents and eat milk chocolate rabbits on Easter morning. What about the very name Easter? Is that a Christian name? Is that biblical? Is that of a Christian origin? Well, let me give you a little English history of our English name Easter. This is just a fact that you can probably find in any encyclopedia. Venerable Bede. You know who Venerable Bede is? He's the ancient, famous, one of the most famous English historians. Venerable Bede, the English historian of around A.D. 700, tells us that the Anglo-Saxon name Easter, or we could say the English name, the English people as such didn't exist in Venerable Bede's day, but our forefathers did, the Anglo-Saxons. That the name Easter came from the name of an Anglo-Saxon and Teutonic spring goddess. How do you like that? Whose name was Eoster. E-O-S-T-R-E. -E. This was an Anglo-Saxon Teutonic spring goddess. Which means just an old English goddess. And she and her name had come from a Babylonian goddess whose Greek name was Astarte and whose Chaldean name was Ishtar. I think it was last week that we pointed out some of the connections that 
from your response, I gather you weren't familiar with from high school or college concerning Persephone, Zeus, Demeter, Pluto, and Ishtar, and Tammuz. That there are connections that all of this started back in Babylon with the death of Tammuz after being uh, stabbed by this wild boar. And his mother weeps over him. And Tammuz, by the way, is a male god, and he's the god of agriculture in ancient Babylon. And the weeping of his mother kind of prepares the soil symbolically to bring him forth. He's resurrected in the springtime. When he's resurrected, this symbolizes the rebirth of nature after the death of winter. And we said that there are direct connections between many legends of the ancient world, like in Greek mythology, where Persephone was kidnapped in the fall time by Pluto and taken to the underworld. You can't say that there is always this, this word for word, God for God, God is for God, it's name for name connection, because there's not, but there's always direct parallels. Because in this case, Demeter is, is the mother of Persephone, both are females, and it was Demeter who was the Greek goddess of agriculture. For the continuation You can't say that there is always this, this word for word, God for God, God is for God, it's name for name connection, because there's not, but there's always direct parallels. Because in this case, Demeter is, is the mother of Persephone, both are females, and it was Demeter who was the Greek goddess of agriculture. But anyway, whenever her daughter Persephone was taken to the underworld by Pluto in the fall, then because her mother was so sorrowful over her daughter being taken from her, she just refused to do her duty, which is to bring forth life and plants and vegetation and so forth in the earth. She kind of, you know, went into a corner and just began to weep and to moan. And whenever springtime came around, it was time for her daughter to be raised from the underworld, not from the dead. You see, there's not, uh, there's where you can't draw a line for line to uh, parallel between the Greek mythology and the Babylonian case of Tammuz, but nonetheless, she is brought forth, not resurrected from the dead, she's still alive, but in the underworld. And she's brought forth from the underworld to the upper world. What happens then? Her mother's so joyful, then she lets things come about as her job and occupation is, which brings about springtime. So there are direct connections between these things. Now, we're talking about an English, or you can call it a Teutonic, or an ancient Anglo-Saxon goddess who has a name that's very, very similar to Astarte, the Greek form of the Chaldean name Ishtar, which means that all the nations of the world got their religions and their mythologies from ancient Babylon some way, some manner, at some time in the past history. They all came there. Or why are there such close connections? between not only the stories, but now we're talking about the very words that are used. Eoster, E-O-S-T-R-E, is a lot like Astarte and even more like Ishtar, which is this Babylonian goddess who is the wife of the Babylonian god Tammuz of agriculture. This name was adopted by the people in Europe of this day this name was adopted as the name for this festival a little bit before the time of Venerable Bede. It didn't have a particular well-known name prior to that, at least among the Anglo-Saxons. We're tracing it now to the United States of America. We came, for the most part, from the Anglo-Saxon people. And so it's just a little prior to Venerable Bede when this name of uh, this Teutonic spring goddess, Yoster, is adopted as the official name for this Babylonian feast. You pretty much have to sooner or later adopt that name since you're following Babylonian mystery religion anyway. What about a verse over in Acts chapter 12 and verse 4? There's one thing I've had questions about. It's been Acts chapter 12 and verse 4. But you know what? <clears throat> it hasn't come as a question right after I told someone the truth about Easter because who has read their Bible and knows anything about Acts 12 for? But about a week or so later, you'll get a phone call. You know what? I was reading my Bible over in Acts chapter 12. Guess what? They celebrated Easter back then because I found it right in my Bible. I had that happen on more than one occasion. You don't get a response right away. 
because no one knows their Bible. But a couple of months later, you see that person again, they'll say, by the way, they've read their Bible since then, or they've looked up in a concordance since then, they found Acts 12 and verse 4. This is a case of Peter in prison. <clears throat> when he had apprehended him, he put him in the prison. This is Herod apprehending Peter. And delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Well, this same Greek word appears 29 times in the New Testament. 29 times. In 28 of the places where it occurs, it's given a different translation. And in the one and only, the 29th time, it's given this translation, Easter. In the early English translations of the Bible, such as in Tyndall and Coverdale, then all, or practically all, of these 29 places were rendered as Easter. Because that's what everyone felt should be done. Everyone believed what the church taught them. This was a well-known festival. And because, remember we talked last week that uh, some people felt that there was an attempt to make a Christian duplication of the Jewish Passover. And so wherever Passover would occur after Calvary especially, then you wouldn't really be talking about Passover if you're talking about Christianity and the church. You'd be talking about this Christian festival known as Easter because that's what they thought the connection was. <clears throat> and so in the old English versions, like Tyndall's and Coverdale's, you'll find them giving Easter as the rendition of this Greek word. But as later revisions came along and improved, then the correct reading was placed in all of these 29 places, <clears throat> even in the King James Version, except here in Acts 12 and verse 4, where it kind of survives as a novel curiosity, a carryover from the earliest English translations of the Bible. How should the word be translated? Well, we've already answered that as Passover. That's what the word means is Passover. Why give it to us as Easter here? Well, that's what, again what we've just been saying. That's what Tyndall and Coverdale gave it. Why did they give it like that? because people thought that the Christian Easter was the parallel to the Jewish Passover. And so even though the word in the Greek is Passover, since we know Christians celebrated Easter because their church did, that's the way they reason backwards, then we'll just turn the word into Easter instead of Passover. Well, he's not talking about a Christian festival during this time. The sacred historian writer Luke is simply giving us the time period of the year to let us know when this is happening, and it's happening around the Jewish Passover. It's not happening around Easter because Easter wasn't celebrated then. In other words, you have to have the presupposition in your mind that Easter is a Christian holiday before you can hope to go back to this verse. Once you find out it's not a Christian holiday or a Christian festival, then you're just honest with yourself, and you leave the word like it's left 28 other times in the New Testament as Passover because that's precisely what the Greek word means. So what we're saying is that Easter, just look at the name. The name Easter comes ultimately from Ishtar. Did you know that this name Ishtar was right in your Bible? Some of you do know. You want to tell us where? Well, I'll help you out. <laughs> Let's start in the book of Judges. Oh, it's found many times, many times in your Bible. The Philistines had a god that was the identical same god as the Babylonian god Ishtar. <clears throat> and oh, Israel herself, guess what? Was caught up worshiping the same god. The church has fallen in the same rut and mistakes that Israel did of old, worshiping yeah. pagan gods around her. Judges, chapter 2. Look in verse 13. The people of God forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. That's the either the Phoenician or, and, because it was served by both foreign 
heathen people, Philistine name for the Babylonian god, goddess Ishtar. Change the initial A to an I and drop the last three letters and look what you have. I-S-H-T-A-R. It's right there in the word Ishtar. You just change a few letters around. Remember when you go from one language to another and one people's religion to another, things change. But there's still a direct connection. Judges 2, 13. They forsook the Lord and they served Baal and they served Ishtar or Ashtaroth. The same book, chapter 10 and verse 6. Just show you a few places where it occurs right in your Bible. I think this is very interesting. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 6 of Judges 10. <coughs> the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord and served Baalim and Ashtaroth, the gods of Aram, Zidon, gods of Moab, and so forth. There it is again, Ashtaroth. 1 Samuel 7, verses 3 to 4. Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth. Again, look at the word. Change the A to an I and drop O-T-H, and you've got Ishtar. From among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Baalim, and Ashtaroth, and serve the Lord only. Then in chapter 12, in verse 10, they cried unto the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and have served Baalim and Ashtaroth. By the way, you ought to be noticing that Baalim and Ashtaroth are always coming side by side here. Right. Chapter, uh, the last chapter, which is, I believe, 31. Verse 10, they put his armor, that is, of uh, the slain former king Saul in the house of Ashtaroth. In the house of Ashtaroth, who did it? The Philistines. It was a god or a goddess served by the Philistines. They fastened his body to the wall, Beth Shem. Then over in 1 Kings, to begin with, chapter 11 and verse 5, we're into the days of King Solomon. Now you want to see this passage and notice we've got a little change. <clears throat> because this goddess is known by two different specific names in your Old Testament, either as Ashtoreth or Ashtoreth. And whenever we look in, uh, in the Old Testament, we study something about uh, the pagan nations of the Old Testament some other time, there's a lot that can be said. There's a lot of confusion concerning all of these gods. I think just in what we've read so far this evening, I think back there in Judges 2, uh, Baal was the name mentioned. In all the other passages, it was Baalim. And now we've seen Ashtoreth. And look here in this verse, Solomon went after Ashtoreth. It's a little bit different of a spelling here. There's a lot of confusion over this, and we'll point out some of the distinctions and what's meant by these names at a later time. So I don't want to get into all of that. The goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And then I think here in the same chapter, verse 33, the same spelling, Ashtoreth, and she's the goddess of the Zidonians. So she's a Phoenician goddess as well as being a Philistine goddess. Then finally in 2 Kings 23 and verse 13. And all you got to do is just open up some Bible handbook and you'll see that they'll tell you that this Ashtoreth or Ashtoreth is the exact same goddess as Ishtar. The exact same one. 2 Kings 23, 13. And here you see it the same as in 1 Kings, Ashtoreth, and she is the goddess of the Zidonians. Now there's also a city in the Old Testament known as Ashtoreth. A long time ago, on a tape, whenever we studied the Rephaim, some of the ancient people of great stature in the Old Testament, we pointed out that there was a valley known in the Old Testament as the Valley of Rephaim. 
because evidently a lot of these giants had lived there at one time. So don't let the name of the city sometimes confuse you. There is obviously a connection. Probably she was the chief goddess of that city. So many people worshipped her there, maybe had some little shrine built to her, that in the future the name of the city became the same as the name of the goddess herself. Her name was attached to that city. There's an actual city known as that in the Old Testament, just like a valley of Rephaim, because a number of the Rephaim people had evidently lived there at one time. Now, in the book of Jeremiah, the name isn't mentioned specifically, as it has been here in Judges, Samuel, and Kings, but she's known as the Queen of Heaven. As the Queen of Heaven. <clears throat> Remember the ancient Babylonian legend that tells us about an egg falling from heaven in the Euphrates and Ishtar hatches out. That's because she was the queen of heaven. Jeremiah mentions her many times. How is she worshipped? She's worshipped by the men and the women, especially the women, making little cakes for her and worshipping her up on top of their houses, up on the housetops. The higher you get to heaven, the closer you are to God, so the ancients informed us. Now there's one final thing I want to come to that I think is the most interesting of all. We've already looked at the egg, the hair, and the name of the festival Easter. But I want to just cap it off by showing you how pagan this festival really is. If you'll turn over to the book of Ezekiel. <clears throat> and that concerns the prevalent Christian tendency to have a sunrise service on Easter morning. Amen. This was the most important part of the ancient festival for the resurrection of Tammuz. The most important part of the festival was to have a sunrise worship nature service. All of the ancient cultures we pointed out before worshipped the sun in a number of different ways. And so the resurrection of Tammuz was vitally associated with sun worship. Take a look at the name of the festival itself. You've got a direction right in the name. East. Where does the sun rise? East. You put one letter in there, an H between the T and the E, and what do you have? East, two words, East Her. Some people have speculated that that's just an ancient formula where something was said such as East Her Sun Will Rise. In the east, her son or her husband, depending on which way you want to interpret the ancient records concerning the relationship between Ishtar and Tammuz, her son will rise. It's not north, it's not west, it's not south. And that's one of the most popular things about Easter is the, for the faithful is the sunrise service. The sun rises in the east, and that's right in the name of the festival itself. Ezekiel, I think it's in uh, chapter 8. So there's a direct relationship to this particular direction on the globe. That being east, because this is where the sun rises, and the rising of the sun symbolizes resurrection. Look in verse 16. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worshipped the sun toward the east. Do you know what we have here? A sunrise service. If it was the afternoon, you couldn't be looking toward the east and worshiping the sun. We have a sunrise service, and all oh, ancient fallen away pagan apostate Israel is worshiping the sun. It's early in the morning, the sun's rising, they've got the back, their back toward the temple because the door of the temple faces eastward. Your back has to be west then, and your face has to be east. And what are you doing? You're worshiping the sun as it rises. And out in the West, in some of these great amphitheaters in California and so forth, they have world-famous sunrise services. Yeah. I think that's one thing I can claim exemption from. It was too early to get up back in those days to go to one of those services. But that's what the faithful are supposed to do on Easter morning. 
is you've got to get there whenever the sun rises. Now, they try to make a spiritualization and connect it between Jesus coming out of the tomb early on that morning, but that's all it is. It's a spiritualization of what the original festival did. It was a worship of the sun. Remember all these connections we've been laboring to get across to you between these festivals and nature worship. The sun, springtime, summer, agriculture, crops, your life depends on it. And people don't know when they're in these huge amphitheaters in Arizona and California on Easter morning and just singing and singing. And then the sun begins to creep up over the horizon that they're participating in ancient Babylon religion and nature worship. Do you want something better than that? You got it, brother. Let's go to the same chapter, verse 13. <clears throat> He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Mm -hmm. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Mm -hmm. It's right in your Bible. Women weeping for Tammuz. We talked for weeks now about the weeping process that prepares the soil to bring forth the God. And people are amazed when they find Tammuz right in their Bible. And Ishtar a number of times. This is the only place where Tammuz is found. But it proves the point from your own Bible without having to read a Bible encyclopedia or dictionary. That all these connections we've been drawing are true. It's women. Number one, they're weeping Number two, and it's over Tammuz, number three, and someone has their face toward the sun early in the morning at a sunrise service, number four. That's all of Easter in a nutshell. That's all of Lent in a nutshell. Lent is this period of weeping and fasting and mourning and penitence over your sin. That's what Lent is for. Come on, you know that it's a period of all of this. That's where the connection is between the weeping of these mothers or wives over their son or husband and the period of Lent, and fasting, giving, alms deeds, penitence, and so forth. It's a period where you're supposed to be mourning. It's what Lent's all about, mourning. What are you mourning for? The death of Tammuz. You wouldn't be mourning for Jesus Christ because he, he was raised from the dead 2,000 years ago. Amen. No sense in mourning over that anymore. He's already ascended to the Father's right hand. Amen. Why are you going through penitence and weeping and mourning? Because you want Tammuz to be raised from the dead. Protestants, Catholics, they're all included. And they're all worshiping Tammuz. And next spring, amphitheaters and churches and old chapels on a hillside will be filled with Christian worshipers of Tammuz on a sunrise service morning. And they think that there's some type of connection, and all it is is a spiritualization connection between Jesus being raised from the dead. Why isn't it in the middle of the day or the afternoon? Well, you've got to worship the sun when he comes up because he gives you all of your life. It's just interesting all the parallels that the world and God in his wisdom hold for us, the S-O-N and the S-U-N. They're both called sun. It could have been the daughter of God from all eternity. He could have planned it that way, or the Father died, or the Holy Spirit died. It says so in versus says you in. It's been that way throughout history, the S-O-N versus the S-U-N. A worship of nature, all forms of nature worship out there. Everything from the can't-eat-this people to the people who wear diapers out on the beach in Florida <laughs> and everything in between <coughs> it's nature worship from the little girls that run around in diapers on a beach to maybe even to the people who actually bow down before the sun I'm sure there's someone around somewhere that still does that today people are still worshiping nature and the sun we talked about spring fever people hate the winter time they could hardly wait for jogging, biking, swimming, boating, fishing weather to get here. It's the springtime. It's a worship of that time of year. Amen. I like all the seasons. Amen. <laughs> Genesis 8.22. I like all of them. Amen. I'd get tired of one of them all the time. 
unless it was the millennium, and I won't ever get tired of that. But until then, I get tired of it just being so hot, you about suffocate. And then you have to fight the snow for a few months, and then it's good to take a break and go into something else. But most people, they don't like this winter time. You hear them a cursing and a swearing at the station over the snow. The filling station, just a swearing up a storm about this blasted snow out there. They don't, they've never read Genesis 8, 22. They never read Psalm 147 and Psalm 148. I don't ever get tired of one or the other. I'm just going to take them all together because I know that each one is going to come to an end sooner or later. Amen. And we're going to have the next one. Well, someone asked long ago, what's in a name? When the name's Christmas or Easter, we could say a lot. 